All right, here we go again, everybody. Thank you for coming out tonight for Populating and Feeling Our Universe, presented by Dr. Steve Kilston. This talk will begin with an astronomical perspective on how our universe came to be populated, with stars making possible what and where humans are. Next, Dr. Kilson will describe how science helps us choose actions compatible with our universe's rules, the laws of nature we recognize as truths, the key to survival of any civilization. He will then explore how we have learned about other worlds beyond Earth and how that knowledge can be used to design and plan eventual travel to some of those worlds, including a plausible interstellar spaceship concept offering one way to extend life across our galaxy. Understanding such ideas may enable us to more fully tune into and identify with our universe and all its reality and potential, intensifying our feelings of connection, unity, and purpose. Starting uh, with Discovering a comet at age 21 for over half a century, Dr. Kilston has applied astronomy and academic research and teaching, planetarium and public lectures, radio programs, and other national and international aerospace projects. At Hughes, Lockheed, and Bell Aerospace, he designed and promoted space-based telescopes, including Iconos, the satellite called in the New York Times one of the most significant developments in the history of the space age, as its high-resolution commercial Earth imaging camera made possible many new technologies, including Google Maps and GPS navigation systems. In Cottage Grove, Grove Steve hosts the Wisdom Seekers Club. He earned a Bachelor of Arts from Harvard, where his thesis under Carl Sagan was entitled A Search for Intelligent Life on Earth, and a PhD from UCLA, where his dissertation titled On the Nature of the Carbon Stars was pro proved stars manufacture life's main chemical elements. And with that, let's welcome back Dr. Steve Kilston. Thank you. Thank you, Maggie, for that great introduction. Uh, but enough about me. We're here to talk about the universe, and we're here to talk about you. So I'm very glad you're here to listen to some of the things that I feel are pretty important, and I hope that you have uh, some thoughts that maybe this will provoke. We won't have any questions until the end, please, because I have so much stuff to get through that I'm a little bit afraid that I won't be able to get through it all. So let's, let's see if we can do it all. I'm sorry? Sorry, what? Space bar. Space bar, okay, got it. All right, so you probably know that a long time ago, people believed that our world was the center of the universe, and that was very comforting and flattering to us. But astronomy found that we are just one of several planets, and the stars and galaxies are very distant. Uh, the philosopher Pascal said, the eternal silences of these infinite spaces frightens me. He probably said it in French. Uh, but is our cosmos cold and hostile? What do you think? Do you feel that the world and the universe is a terrible place or is it a nice place? Now, for an astrophysicist, uh, the truth is out there. I like this uh, cartoon. It says, if my work helps just one person feel like a tiny, insignificant speck lost in a cold, uncaring universe, then I'm doing my job, okay? <laughs> Let me go back to when I was a kid. My father took me to the public library nearly every two weeks from the age of about seven. And I remember one of the first times he took me to the library, he got me a book there that was about giant stars and I had never known anything about that. And I found out that there was a star named Betelgeuse, or Betelgeuse as we say, uh, that was much bigger than the Earth's orbit, that if it were where our sun was, we'd be inside it. And there are other stars that have been found since then that are much bigger even than Betelgeuse. So I want you to understand that there are some stars out there way, way bigger than, than our own sun, and our sun is pretty big too. Our sun is bigger than a million Earths in size. Now, I want to say, before I forget, that I feel very fortunate that I had 
parents that were interested in educating me and I had a good education in the schools and colleges I went to. I feel very grateful for that and I feel that it's sort of my privilege to, to have learned some of these things. When I was in about, uh, I guess, sixth grade or seventh grade, I managed to learn what the constellation Orion looked like. Pro how many of you have ever seen the constellation Orion? Qu quite a few of you, with the Orion's belt there in the middle. And you have in Orion uh, Betelgeuse, which is the star I mentioned before, and another bright star at the bottom called Rigel. Uh, my son is named Rigel after, after that star. In junior high school, and this is a bit of my education, I had a science project to do in the ninth grade. I had a pretty good teacher there. Uh, and I put together with a friend uh, a poster board that had on it lots of little clay balls representing protons and uh, other atomic particles that showed how the sun made its energy. As you know from the trivia quiz, the sun turns hydrogen, which is the, the proton, is the hydrogen nucleus, into helium. And these are hydrogen nuclei here, and they end up by combining in various ways with neutrinos coming off and positrons, little bits of energy being produced, and they end up with a helium nucleus here, which is two protons and two neutrons. Now that happens in the sun, and uh, the sun is able to do that because gravity pulls the sun very tightly together. The sun is very, very big and has a lot of gravity. And in the center of the sun, that gravity makes very high temperatures and high pressures. Does anybody know what happens to atoms at very, very high temperatures? Yes? Well, they go very fast. They, they go very, very fast. And it was necessary for these protons, which have positive charges, to go very fast to get close to each other. Otherwise, they would repel each other. They would try to push away. But at very fast speeds, if they're going that fast in the center of the sun, they can't stop bumping into each other, okay? It's a very crowded situation. So that's why there is no such thing as cold fusion. There is only hot fusion, where things get pushed together very fast. And that happens in the sun because of this. Also, the fact that gravity pulls it in means that if the center gets hotter than it should and it expands the, the sun bigger, that that will cool the center and it will stop producing that much energy and it will come back down again. That keeps a wonderful balance. The balance that the sun has between gravity pulling it in and the fusion reactions creating energy in the center makes the sun last for about 10 billion years. We still have about five billion years to go, so you don't have to worry about it running out of fuel. <laughs> However, after I did this project, my grade for it was a C, because Mr. Miller says I wasn't doing science, I was just explaining other scientists' conclusions. <laughs> Little did he know that this would eventually turn into my doctoral thesis. The first person to classify stars as to their different types was a, a Franciscan father in Rome at the observatory there. And he found that looking at the colors of the stars and the spectra, which have different uh, missing features in them, the, the dark lines you see there, there were four main types of stars. We now know that the first of these types had mainly hydrogen features showing there in the star. The second type had lots of metal spectral lines, as we call them, from iron and sodium and so on. The third type of star had molecule features of oxygen molecules. And the fourth was the most unusual kind. It had very few features, but big, broad bands. And that later turned out to be the carbon stars. OK. All right. Uh, now, this is a diagram that a lot of astronomers use, but I just wanted to tell you that there are stars that are very hot over here, 30,000 degrees on their surface or so, and there are stars that are very cool, like Betelgeuse and so on, maybe only 3,000 degrees in temperature, and stars in between. Our sun is sort of an average star right about there. Uh, Rigel, my, s my own sun, is up there. It's a supergiant star. These are the big stars. These are the little stars. Those are the... 
hot stars and these are the cool stars. And they have different classes which turned out to have these labels given to them, O, B, A, F, G, K, M. And astronomers tried to remember what those labels are in order by making up a little song that said, O, B, A, fine girl, and then kiss me. And then there were three other weird stars, the R, N, and S star, so they said, kiss me right now, smack. <laughs> when I was in college, uh, I was very lucky to have this woman as my teacher. She was quite a bit older than this picture when I had her. But in 1925, uh, she wrote what was considered the most brilliant doctoral thesis in the history of astronomy, and she proved that the stars, especially the sun, were made up mainly of hydrogen and helium. Nobody knew that at the time because the spectra showed all those other things, the iron and the calcium and so on. Uh, she became Harvard's first female full professor, and uh, it was a great ex privilege to be working for her. Cecilia Payne, later she got married, Cecilia Payne Gopashkin. Well, there's a bunch of things on this slide I'll try to go through quickly. I want to say I went to UCLA for graduate school where I learned how to program computers and how stars uh, were on the inside and how they change as they burn up their nuclear fuel. Uh, the next year I published my paper with Carl Sagan on looking for intelligent life on Earth and uh, met my wife in the Bay Area and discovered a comet, which was all very nice. And then I began doing research on carbon stars using uh, electronic imagers and uh, telescopes and special filters that were sensitive to the carbon molecule so I could try to find carbon stars. I was looking for these red giants, just like Betelgeuse that I had found as a seven-year-old, but the filters had an infrared leak and that messed up everything, so I failed. But later, I, I did some work at the University of Hawaii and the professor there and Bozgard said I should analyze spectra that were collected by another man at Berkeley that was important, I had that tool to use. And finally, uh, I went to a lecture at USC, of all places, and found that Benjamin Peary, a famous ast Amer African American astrophysicist, had found that there were stars that had technetium in it. That's very important, because technetium is a radioactive element that decays. And if you can see that in the star spectra, that meant that the star must have made it because if it had been born with it, it would have all disappeared and decayed already. So I knew that the stars made some of their own materials in their centers. And this is maybe the main picture from my doctoral thesis. It shows that I used the computer to match the spectra of carbon stars and find how much carbon they had in them, how much iron, how much yttrium, and other chemical elements. I was able to match the spectrum the real spectrum of the star is the line you see in black here, and what I did on the computer are the dots in black that I used to match the spectrum and find out how much of the different chemical elements it had. And what I found was there was so much carbon in the stars that the star must have manufactured carbon. This is how a star manufactures carbon. It takes the helium. You know, the sun is making helium right now, right as we speak. And that helium later in the star's life can be used to combine to make three helium nuclei into a carbon nucleus. And that is called the triple alpha process because the helium nucleus is an alpha particle. Well, let's look at what a red giant star is actually doing. In the center of a red giant star, it has already burnt hydrogen to make helium. Remember that's what the sun is doing? So the center becomes pure helium, all right? And when the center becomes pure helium, there's still some hydrogen on the outside of that that all collapses together to get even hotter, and the hydrogen starts burning, and that produces uh, more energy because the helium on the center is, with its gravity, pulling the hydrogen tighter and heating it up to, to make so much uh, heat that it pushes out the rest of the star. That's how we get a star as big as a red giant, okay? And later, after it has run out of helium in the center, the helium I is there, but then it gets hotter and it makes carbon. Remember I showed you how helium makes carbon? And that makes another level. Around that becomes a shell of helium, and the shell of helium is unstable, and that 
tends to produce a burst which carries the material from the center of the star out to the outside. And that's really important because it looks like this. Here is a carbon star which has layers of helium shell flash material that has been taken from the center of the star and sent off into space. Now, our solar system, you all ought to know this, our own solar system here with all the planets, including us right here, and our sun, are all that is made out of material that came from stars like this that added to the hydrogen and helium in the universe, added carbon and iron and other stuff like that, and made it possible for life to exist in the universe. In this talk, I am trying to tell you where we came from and where we are going, and maybe a little bit about how we can get there. Uh, and we started off, us, by this process of having stars make material that is now in our bodies. Some other stars also help to send material out into space. Supernovae are bigger stars than most carbon stars, and they really explode violently. Um, I just read uh, the other day that a supernova uh, might have been what caused big fires to occur on the Earth about two million years ago or so, and that caused forests to burn down and caused apes to start standing up, up standing upright so they could look out over the grass and see the threats because they weren't living in the forest anymore. Strange things. But supernovae you probably heard about. They're the biggest exploding stars. N now, when we get all these stars making chemical elements and putting it into the universe, that's creating almost like a pantry of materials that we can use. And what I want to show here is that the dying low mass stars, these are carbon stars pretty much, they make the stuff that's in green here, carbon and nitrogen and a few other chemical elements. Those stars are very important. The supernovae, which are exploding massive stars uh, and exploding white dwarfs, both of these, they make a lot of the other elements. So we know where almost all the chemical elements that we have in the universe come from now. And it's not just all from the beginning. It's constantly being manufactured. And what happens to that material? Well, we have gravity still working all over the universe, and gravity pulls some of this fresh material, this fertilized material, together. And here you see two places where baby stars and baby solar systems are forming, okay? These are all condensing out of gravity, and they get very hot in the middle where gravity pulls them together, and those are all brand new stars, much younger than our own sun. Pretty, pretty places, too. Stellar nurseries. Now, of course, our solar system is one of the things that got, m was able to use this material uh, to make planets and, and our sun. Uh, here's a nice picture of our solar system, but it sort of overemphasizes the Earth. The Earth really isn't as, is not as big as Jupiter or Saturn or those other things. In fact, if we go out to Saturn and look back, which we did with the Cassini spacecraft, we can look back with Saturn blocking the sun perfectly, we can look back over there and we can barely see the Earth. There's the Earth seen from the distance of Saturn, uh, almost, uh, let's see, that would be almost a billion miles away. But our little tiny Earth still, as you know, has a lot of things going for it. Uh, it has human beings, none of the other planets happens that, and it also has the beauty that human beings can add to the universe through their art. So uh, we must remember that even though we're on a tiny place in the universe, it's a wonderful place. Now, this was one of the questions on your trivia uh, test. So remember that I said that calcium was only 1.5% of your body. Okay, that's true. Most of your body is made up of water, and so oxygen and hydrogen, H2O, make up most of the weight of your body. And there are lots of other chemicals. But except for the hydrogen, all of those chemicals in your body were made where? Inside stars. So remember that. You are made of that stuff that was inside stars. So I want to review what I've just been talking about. 
Gravity and shock waves compress gas and dust clouds to form stars. Nuclear reactions deepen each star, create new elements, and prov provide energy to resist gravity and make the star shine and bring material to the stellar surface. Now, the old stars are then enriched with new elements, and those stars, when they're old, can explode or just uh, if sort of evaporate the material into space. And that enriched material can form new solar systems, including our own. And the atoms inside us came from earlier stars so that we are all made of stardust. That's the sign of the former Stardust Hotel in Las Vegas. <laughs> These are some lyrics from Joni Mitchell's song about Woodstock called We Are Stardust, We Are Golden, okay? And there's another song named Stardust for those of you who are a little bit older, you might remember. <laughs> now, there are other planets besides the ones in our solar system. Uh, when uh, in 1952, uh, an astronomer just thought about this. He realized that not all planets had to be like the ones in our solar system. There could be some that were hot Jupiters that are bigger than our own Earth and but much closer to their star. And the first one of these was discovered in 1995, when most of you, uh, I guess, were already alive and, and, and knew about these things. Uh, we finally found another solar system. And as of today, there are 4,094 confirmed planets outside our own solar system. And at least 3,000 other solar systems with at least 664 of them having more than one planet. That's a lot of solar systems out there already. Now, how were these mostly found? Uh, I'll tell you about that in a minute, but I want to say that some of them are fairly close to our own solar system. Here we are at the sun, you are here, and these stars, not too far from the sun, this is only out to 20 light years away, these stars all have exoplanets, other planets in other solar systems. Not too far away, someday humans, I think, will go there. Maybe we don't know exactly what the exoplanets look like. We have some imagination that artists have. But we do know that there is a habitable zone around each star, and if we want a planet that's good for life, it can't be too close to the star, because then it gets too hot, and it can't be too far, it gets too cold. It has to be in just the right distances, like Goldilocks, it can't have it too extreme one way or the other, and that would make a place called the habitable zone. So have we found any planets in habitable zones? The answer is yes. These are a few of the habitable exoplanets we have found that are just about at the right distance, that we think they have the right temperature. What's the right temperature? It's pretty much the temperature that water remains liquid. We think that's a good temperature for life. We think if it's terribly cold or terribly hot, it would be hard to have the kinds of molecular interactions that make life possible. Now, here was a trick question on your trivia quiz. Kepler was not a person. Well, Kepler was a person. But the Kepler in the quiz was a spacecraft named after the person, okay? And this Kepler spacecraft was built by the company that I worked for in Colorado. And this Kepler spacecraft has found over 2,700 exoplanets on its own. It did that by looking for changes in the brightness of the stars that it was looking at. And if the star got a little tiny bit dimmer and did that over and over in a regular way, that meant that a planet was traveling in front of it and blocking the light from the star. That's called the transit of the planet, and that is how Kepler found all these planets. It's still one of the most important uh, spacecraft that we've ever launched to tell us how many planets there are out there. We have, from Kepler's observations, decided that there are about 11 billion potentially Earth-like planets in their habitable zones in our galaxy. That's a lot of possible places that there might be other people giving a talk like this and listening to a talk like this, okay? But we need to know more about the planets than just how big they are, 
and if they're at the right distance from the star to tell if they're really habitable. We might need to know something about whether they have a moon. We might need to know something about uh, whether they have plate tectonics. We might need to know something about whether they have water. And so we want to build other spacecraft that can tell us more about the planets. Here are some potential ones. They're hoping to la launch in two years the James Webb Space Telescope, which is a huge telescope, much bigger than the Hubble Space Telescope, and it has a sun shield to, to stop the sun from uh, interfering with what it sees. That's one that we hope will help us find out more about other planets. Uh, we, of course, could do SETI, or Search for Extraterrestrial Intelligence Observations of many kinds, radio waves or laser signals or something. And then other big telescopes on the ground or in space in the future, and one which we might launch uh, maybe 60 years from now that might have several telescopes that are really large and could get a picture of a planet in another solar system, maybe that good, that would tell us if it had oceans and continent, continents and things like that. So these are some of the plans. I worked on this for about 10 years on a project called Terrestrial Planet Finder. And my question soon after I started working on that was, if we find a habitable planet, and we know that it's habitable, what are we going to do about it? And my answer was to come up with the ultimate project. Why was I inspired to think about doing something interstellar? Well, I watched the Apollo uh, moonwalk uh, when that happened in July uh, 20th, 1969. That's almost 75 years ago, and that we're that's when the Bohemia Mining Days Parade will have its 50th anniversary uh, this year. And then exactly seven years later, the Viking lander gave us our first picture from the surface of Mars. Uh, how many of you have ever seen a Star Trek? Would you raise your hands? Okay, good. Because while I was at uh, JPL, to Carl Sagan and I were the only two guys looking at a TV monitor, seeing the first picture come down from Mars. Uh, I met Gene Roddenberry, the creator of Star Trek. He was there also. And I wanted to point out that in Star Trek, the weapon they carry around called a phaser has two settings, kill and stun, which is my name, so I, I like that very much. <laughs> this is what has happened to the model of the Starship Enterprise. So this is for space, the final front yard. No, they actually have a better model of it that's now in the Smithsonian Museum of, Aer of Aerospace Museum in Washington, D.C., so you can see that there. The ultimate project, I mentioned that. That's something I came up with to try to show how we might, we might be able to go to other stars and other habitable planets if we find them. And this is the idea that I came up with, and I've passed this idea off to uh, quite a few people in, in uh, aerospace and science, and, and I've presented this talk uh, about the spaceship uh, at MIT and Harvard and NASA and, and various other places, and I think I've come up with an idea that could work. Now, it's not going to work right away. It's a pretty big idea. It has a million travelers on this spaceship. It has 100 million tons. It will cost about $50 trillion and take at least 500 years till we launch it. So that sounds like a fairly ambitious ultimate project. Also, the trip will take thousands of years to get where we're going. Why will it take so long? Because I don't think there's really anything like warp drive. I don't think we can go as fast as or faster than the speed of light. And I don't want to go so fast that when we bump into tiny little grains of sand or asteroids that we totally crash and destroy our spaceship. So I want it to go maybe a few times faster than the fastest stars go, but not too much faster than that. Anyway, it'll take thousands of years to get to the nearest stars and, and planets that we might want to visit. Now, with all these layers here, on the outside layer, by the way, of this ship is water, and that protects you from all the radiation that might interfere with uh, life. Uh, and also, there are plenty of levels so that you could have enough room so that even with a million people on board this ship, you could have about a 5,000 square foot house for each family of four people or something like that. <laughs> Plus lots of parks and recreation and uh, laboratories and other things like that. Uh, 
like you see here, you'd have recreational areas. And this ship is about one kilometer in radius, which was the answer on your trivia quiz for how big it has to be spinning about once a minute to give you the equivalent of Earth's gravity so that you would have something to uh, hold you to the floor when you're walking around. All this has been worked out. Uh, I want to say, though, that the size of this is pretty big. There's the Great Pyramid in Egypt for comparison in the size, okay? It's a lot bigger than that pyramid. And uh, we can't spin it faster so it could be smaller and still have gravity. Because if you spun it much faster than that, space medicine experts have said that you would always be very space sick. So we have to make sure that it doesn't spin too fast around. I, I did a lot of calculations, you don't have to read all this, to show that we could work out all the power and, and mass and, and uh, how much uh, acceleration there would be and, and all that sort of stuff. But this has all been sort of carefully gone over for many years and it is a possible solution to going to another star. We'd have about, oh, 10 tons of fuel, uh, which isn't that bad, T 10 million tons of fuel, sorry, 10 million tons of fuel out of the 100 million tons of this ship. So it's a pretty big ship. And it has a schedule. As an aerospace engineer, I learned all about schedules for projects and so on. Uh, for the next 100 years, we're generating ideas. And we might settle Mars if we're lucky. Uh, for the 100 years after that, we do a design concept, a little more detail. I have no idea what it's really going to look like because there's a lot more that we need to learn still. Uh, then we'll demonstrate all the technologies and maybe have some space colonies in our own solar system to test them out. And then assemble the project materials. And then by the year 2400, have a 100-year test voyage in our own solar system to see that everything is working OK. And then if it, everything's cool, then we'll take off for another star in the year 2500 AD. I am optimistic that we could do this because I've seen how much computers and technology have advanced in the last century. Do you realize it was only 41 years from the first airplane to getting into outer space with a rocket? OK? Things happen pretty fast. But there are very huge challenges beyond the technical challenges. There are challenges of psychological nature, social, societal nature, and environmental nature. Uh, we have to fix the environment on Earth to be able to do this. We cannot let the Earth decay. We have to make sure that people aren't killing each other if they're on a ship for 10,000 years. Uh, they have to learn how to get along. Um, and all these things have led me to what I am going to talk about in the last part of this presentation, which is maybe what kind of psychological and societal things we might need to fix to be able to go off to another solar system. And not just to another solar system, but if we could do this, then when we got to another solar system, we could build more ships like this, and we could not only establish uh, colonies, perhaps, but we might be able to populate the whole galaxy and go off to that 100,000 uh, light year galaxy. It has its own habitable zone. If you're too close to the center of the galaxy, things are too violent in there near a big central black hole and lots of exploding stars. And if you're too far away from the center of the galaxy, there hasn't been enough stellar processing of chemical elements to make it easy for life to exist out there too well. So there's even a habitable zone in our own galaxy where things are just right. Now, I think it would take us about 40 million years to populate the whole galaxy. That sounds like a long time, but it's not nearly as long as the galaxy uh, is going to exist. We have you know, billions of years more for that. So it's, it's a pretty, pretty nice uh, speed that we can get out there. And I want to say, that uh, if things are going bad on Earth, which I hope they will, won't, I hope we learn how to take care of things here, that it's good to have a chance to put our eggs in another basket and maybe extend human life somewhere else. Uh, if you're interested, some of the people say, well, nobody's, wanna gonna, nobody's gonna wanna leave the Earth. I've given this talk many different places at high schools and colleges and 
and uh, research institutes and so on. And I've always asked the question, how many of you would be willing to go on such a trip? And I'd like you to raise your hands. Okay, that's not bad. I usually get about 20% of the people say they're willing to leave the Earth. And of course, remember, if you're going on a ship like this, probably the million people or so on the ship will make it so you don't get too bored. There's a lot of people there. And most of them would be fairly intelligent and, and nice people selected for the journey. So you might have a better time on the ship than you have in some places you live here on Earth. All right, so here's the last section of my talk, uh, the feeling our universe. That's a strange thing. I don't know how many of you have ever thought about feeling our universe. But that begins with the realization that we are made of stardust, stars are in our flesh and bones, and that to a certain degree, therefore, our universe is inside us. Of course, we are helping the universe that's inside us to do various things like experiencing and feeling and acting and so on, and developing science, which helps us understand what the universe is all about and maybe makes possible more wisdom. But I'm claiming now, after many, many decades of studying astronomy and, and teaching and, and thinking about this stuff, uh, that we not only have to learn through knowing and research, we also have to learn a little bit through feeling. And I say, and this is important, that if we're going to do any of the stuff I talked about a little while ago about spaceships and going off into the galaxy, that this will demand profound progress in feeling. Some of you have seen some books published on this recently, things called emotional intelligence and so on. And I think that feeling is not just something that is, um, I don't want touchy-feely, I guess is the word, but it is also something that's very important for our survival in the universe. And talking about touchy-feely, the first feelings any of us had were probably feelings of touch, okay? Feeling pressure and temperature and texture, those kind of things. Uh, and we feel the universe every time we go outside and we feel the sun making our skin warm. Uh, our sun is a life star. It powers almost everything on the Earth, and we are in contact with that star as it, its light is connecting to us. And astronomy now shows that everything in the universe is connected, interconnected and interacting. And I claim that this is the biggest insight humans have had in the past century, that we live in a thoroughly interconnected universe, not one that's way out there. I used to always start talks with saying, where is the universe? And people would point, oh, it's out there. I would say, no, it's also in here, okay? You have to realize that we are not separate from the universe. In fact, if you throw or catch a ball, you are our universe doing that. And the ball is our universe. You have the power of the universe. And I ask if you can feel being the universe. That's a hard thing. You were not raised to think of yourself as the universe, but maybe you can adapt that way. And thinking of yourself as the universe is just as valid as your thinking of yourself as being this body, when it's mostly your brain in there, that's the only part that's doing that, right? But you think of your whole body as being you, you can think of your whole universe being you also. You are un our universe thinking, you are our universe listening to the talk. Right now, these words you hear right now, this little thing, that's our universe making noise, right? Okay, and our universe choosing, dancing, making mistakes, and laughing at itself. Now, I'm trying to help people figure out how to feel the universe. That's, that's, that's sort of my mission in life at this stage, I think. Uh, first of all, I think you begin to feel the universe by trying to be a little bit like a child. You can feel things a little better if you don't have a whole bunch of words going through your head all the time. Most of us have a dialogue all the time going through our heads. And trying not to know what's gonna happen next. If you're always thinking what's gonna happen next, you're not feeling the now so much. Saul Bellow, the novelist, said, everything is to be viewed as though for the first time and if you've studied some Eastern practices, you might have heard of Zen mind is beginner's mind. It's, if you see it for the first time, it makes a, 
really stronger impression on you. So I hope that you can think about trying to connect to our universe as something that you're really sensing, not talking about so much, not imagining uh, the way it should be or what chores you have to do, but just really paying attention to it as it is. And can you feel the universe as it feels you? Because I believe in Newton's third law, for every action there's an equal and opposite reaction, that if you're feeling the universe, it's always feeling you too, okay? Uh, a famous uh, philosopher poet wrote something about that, Khalil Gibran, and forget not that the earth delights to feel your bare feet and the winds long to play with your hair. Now here we are in Oregon where there are lots of trees and I want you to understand about feeling the universe that Douglas fir trees grow on the average about two feet taller per year. You all know that, I think. And if you do a few calculations about that, that shows that uh, the average tree speed getting taller is 200 atoms taller every second. That's happening. The tree is changing by 200 atoms every second taller. I don't know if you've ever thought about that. And grass grows even faster. So all those atoms are getting added on there all the time. Well, that's part of feeling the universe. If you can try to let yourself feel that that's happening, that's part of feeling the universe. I have actually been able to feel the earth turning. Does anybody here know what direction the earth is turning right now? Can you point to it? The earth is pointing, the, is turning that way, to the east. That's why the sun rises in the east, okay? That's why the full moon rises in the east at 6 p.m. approximately, okay? We are turning that way right now. Here in Oregon, we're going about 700 miles an hour that way right now, okay? I have been able to feel that, not quite the way you say, but by looking at what's happening in the sky and just the way you can see clouds moving and stuff. I see the stars and planets moving. I've been able to feel the earth turning. Uh, when you see the sun rise or set, you can feel the earth turning, okay? Children feel our always changing reality very intensely because everything is new to them. And we, as adults, can learn to feel again that we are part of a flowing, growing, active universe. A universe in a, that in its own way is alive, through us it's alive, and it incorporates us. Well, I'm gonna talk about feeling, and I know that that's not something you often get in the science pub, so I hope you can uh, bear with me here. But in my opinion, Wanting to feel things means to want contact and connection with things, okay? And the richness of your experiences has to do with how much feeling, how much connecting, how intense it is. And we often also want to share our feelings with others. That's why I'm here right now. I'm trying to share my feelings with you. And because that strengthens the feelings we have you know, if you're with someone watching a TV show or a movie, you feel together with that person, you're ex having the same experience, you can have sympathetic vibrations, if you wish, to the thing. That strengthens your own feelings. And I also think that fully sharing your feelings with other people means being aware of their feelings. I used to give planetarium lectures uh, in 600-seat auditorium, and if there were 20 people in the auditorium, and somebody laughed, the laughter would die out before it got somewhere. If, of course they'd laugh because I told good jokes. But anyway, they would laugh and nothing much would happen. But if the auditorium was full and 600 people were there, then that would be like a chain reaction and everybody in the place would laugh. So sharing your feelings makes that sympathetic vibrations. And I also have this picture here because I claim that we gain connections and feelings more easily if we are reaching outward for them. We are reaching outward to, to accept those feelings as they're coming in. All right, now there are things that interfere with feeling and we have to be aware of those things. If we're spending all our time analyzing things or interpreting things, uh, if we're s trying to you know, decide what our tasks are or our chores, if we're imagining things and or if we're stereotyping and classifying and all that, or if we're afraid of things, we tend 
to withdraw inward in those cases. All those things can interfere with feeling. And I would claim that for most of us in the culture that we live, we spend more time doing these things than we spend feeling, unfortunately. We have to be careful with that. So th the functions in our mind, we have parts of our mind that enjoy feeling and they want to have uh, you know, stimulation and they want to have sensations, but there are other parts of our mind that are telling it, don't feel anything. Be careful, watch out. So we have to be careful about controlling our feelings too much. Now, some of you know that uh, meaning is important. I hope most of you think meaning is important, but I think that meaning is important a lot in the moment, not, the mirroring, not just the meaning that is gonna tell what happens to you when you're, uh, I guess, buying a house or, or when you have a child or uh, when you die or anything like that. I think the meaning that happens right now is important too. Uh, the, the great philosopher Wittgenstein said, if we take eternity to mean not infinite temporal duration, but timelessness, then eternal life belongs to those who live in the present. Okay, that's how you get eternity, by living right now. Uh, well, you've heard about the question to be or not to be. I claim that really means to feel or not to feel. If you're really being, if you're really existing, you should be feeling. If you're not feeling, to me, you're not really being. And that's a m something inside ourselves. And I, I would like to speculate, and this is something I don't know for sure, that we're not just little objects around here in this room, that we are the connections themselves that are tying us to the other things in the universe. Now, I'll say a brief couple of words here about religions, too. Most religions value similar goals of connection, of thought and feeling and action. Uh, I like Abraham Lincoln's statement about how religion is action. When I do good, I feel good. When I do bad, I feel bad. That's my religion. Uh, the Rabbi Hillel 2,000 years ago said, if I'm only for myself, who am I? So that's the connection beyond yourself that makes you a valuable person. <coughs> the novelist Thomas Mann said that religion is a feeling and taste for the infinite. As an astronomer, I, I like that part because we get out to the infinite a little more but I think you need that feeling. And I think that re re most religions offer enlightenment and insight to their adherents, but if everything is connected, as I say it is in the universe, even science and religion have to be connected. Well, our greatest scientist philosopher was quoted as saying, science without religion is lame, and religion without science is blind. What that meant to him, I think, religion was the feeling of awe about our universe. That's what motivates us to want to find out about things and motivates us to do science. But it also implies a kind of humility about oneself, if you have awe about the universe, and perhaps gratitude for what you have in the universe. In his last interview that he did when he was just a little bit older than I am now, he said, one cannot help but be in awe when he contemplates the mysteries of eternity, of life, of the marvelous structure of reality. It is enough if one tries merely to comprehend a little of this mystery each day. Never lose a holy curiosity. Try not to become a man of success, but try to become a man of value. He is considered successful in our day who gets more out of life than he puts in. But a man of value will give more than he receives. Well, there are dangers to feelings, too. Sometimes people have bad feelings. I'd like to talk about Star Wars. How many of you have ever seen the Star Wars movie? Okay, some of you might have heard about something called The Force. And in The Force, uh, there's a bright side, sort of, and a dark side. The dark side of The Force is hate. It may feel like power, but ultimately it destroys, causing pain and suffering. I was in the Ukraine last fall, and I saw this monument, which was a memorial to the murdered children in the big massacre that they had there. There are very many bad things that happen with feelings, too. So Rachel Carson, who, who wrote The Silent Spring, said, the more clearly we can focus 
our attention on the wonders and realities of the universe about us, the less taste we shall have for s destruction. So I claim that when you feel the universe is on your side instead of against you, don't feel the hate, but feel the love. You can feel the bright side of the force. So getting close to the end here, we belong in our universe and it belongs in us, okay? Whether you're an extraterrestrial, whether you're uh, out in the galaxies seeing beautiful objects like this, whether you're over at Wildwood Falls there, jumping off the cliffs and swimming, we have a lot of wonderful things in our universe and all of those are inside us in a way and we belong in our universe that way too. So finally, why should we populate the universe? Why should we feel our universe? All the stuff I've been saying, it's sort of very out there, I know. Well, because we have life, because we have had biological evolution that made life and allowed us to have brains that could imagine a future that gave us foresight, and once you can imagine the future, you can think of what you want to do in that future, and that's what purpose is, what your purpose is. So that evolution added purpose to our universe. And because we're part of this big universe, we're on a giant purposeful team. I like the phrase, thank your lucky stars, because that's what we're doing here. I have an attitude of gratitude. A, a fine philosopher author said, nothing changes until feelings change. That's what, what we feel is obviously more important than what we know. That's what we live for. I don't think we'll be able to achieve interstellar travel until we have really understood our feelings better and only can change the world and make the environment and everything else in the world better if our feel feelings change. And finally, for children, the purpose of life is to evolve toward beauty. In giving education to children, the first consideration should be that the seeds of beauty are sown in their hearts. So here, my wife and I are having a good time enjoying the universe. I'm wearing a shirt there. I don't know if you can read it. It says, General Manager of the Universe. Uh, <laughs> and the final thoughts I have for you are, all objects and ideas are totally interconnected and interdependent. We help our universe feel, think, increase beauty and have purpose. And feeling our full connection to our universe can strengthen us and help us to do all the things that we want to do in the world. Thank you very much. I'm thanking you for your, your attention to this somewhat difficult talk. All right, do you have any questions? Yes, go ahead. Okay. Yes. Yes, the question was, or the observation was, that our universe isn't static, it's always changing, new stars are being born, all sorts of things are happening. I tried to give that idea a, a little bit with the atoms being added to every tree every second and so on. The universe is, in a sense, alive. It, things are always happening in the universe, and that's a nice thing. You wouldn't want it always to be static. It's easier to understand things that don't change, but we have to learn to go along with the universe in order to understand it, okay? Yes? The question is, was well, there a universe before our universe? It's possible. I am a fan of a theory called the multiverse theory. I think there are possibly lots of universes. I can only talk about ours as the only one that I can get information about. But there might have been other universes in the past. There might, have been, there might be other universes in the future. And those maybe we'll never be able to know about. Uh, but we have some reason to think they may exist. Uh huh. So it's not our, our innate sense of education mm -hmm. to define us to feeling what we feel. In other words, we, we start limiting ourselves to feeling. Uh, 
Uh, to feeling what was the last word? Right. Uh, the question really was, I think, how much does our education define our abilities to have feeling for our universe? I think that we are very much conditioned by our parents and by our education and by our whole culture. And we have to be very careful that uh, we are absorbing the kinds of lessons and, and uh, perspectives that are going to help us in the future. S sometimes there's a, we're bombarded with stuff that fills us with hate or fills us with anger uh, or f makes us think that everything is about earning money or makes us think that everything is about uh, beating uh, somebody else uh, in, in a race of some kind. And those kind of things, I think, all interfere with feelings. So we have to, we have to make sure that we don't let our, our world get distorted. Uh, and part of that is making sure that we have an educational system that promotes the kinds of things I'm talking about, I hope. Yes? Uh huh. I can give you, th the question is about intuition and, and whether that allows us to use our feelings to find out things and make the right decisions and so on. And I am a big fan of intuition. I think intuition is great. But I think in my perspective, intuition is made up of your experiences and your ability to understand those experiences. And that's what gives you good intuition. So if you have those experiences, then you're much more likely to have the proper response. I, I like to play chess, for example, and I like to play fast chess, and I don't always have time to think about whether my move is a good move. I have to use my intuition to make the right move based on a, a lot of other games that I've played in the past. And I think that's the way life is, too. We often have to make decisions more quickly than we can think about all the possible ramifications, and that's our intuition. Yes? The intuition is, and you say the same thing when you look at physics, when you talk to the general public, if I'm swinging a ball around my head in holding it in a string and I let go of that string, most people will answer what actually happens incorrectly because there's an intuitive feeling. We do not check our intuition. Okay, so that was about the fact that people often have false expectations of what's going to happen. If you th swing a ball around your head uh, and then you let go of the string, what's going to happen to the ball? Some people think it's going to go in that direction. Some people think it's going to go out. Other people think things that maybe wouldn't, wouldn't really happen according to the rules of physics. And to have the right answer to things, you can't just rely on your feelings, usually. You have to have some knowledge as well that helps you out. So I think joining your knowledge and your feelings together is what makes you really powerful, okay? So when uh, in Star Wars, uh, I think Luke was taught to trust your feelings, uh, that's only good if he's had some training, okay? All right. Any other questions? All right, well, thank you all very much. I'm very pleased. Oh, sorry, go ahead. I agree. Jupiter is a very bright planet right now, and it, it's worth your looking at with binoculars. Yes. Well, again, thank you, and have a great uh, rest of your time in the galaxy.